In the past several weeks, we have been looking at a number of events and teaching moments by Jesus as he's making his way on his journey to Jerusalem. To a place where there's a cross that's waiting for him. In today's lesson, a number of other events have taken place, but they have been skipped over by the lectionary, so to speak, and bypassed. But we find that as Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, a multitude of disciples greet him with a royal acclamation. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This takes place on what we've come to call Palm Sunday. As he drew to within sight of the city, Jesus weeps in sorrow over Jerusalem's lack of recognition of him and for its imminent destruction that's coming in the future. Upon entering the city, Jesus goes to the temple not to worship or pay homage, but to drive out those who were buyers and sellers. And then Jesus seems to take up residence there. He's teaching in the temple, as Luke says, every day while his opponents seek an opportunity and a means to kill him, to be rid of him. And so it is, we come to this particular passage that I read just a moment ago where the Sadducees have come to him. They've come to him, bringing to him yet another question to see if there was any way by which they could entrap him. You can almost feel the tension that's in the, in the air as we find that Jesus is there and these religious leaders come with their question again. He just had talked to them about the, a parable about paying taxes and about who the coins were that they used to pay the taxes. He would kind of sidestepped that particular situation as what he said there was not something that they could particularly argue with particularly considering they were under Roman occupation. And then he tells another parable about the wicked tenants. And he evades that trap. Jesus again, again avoids a trap of the religious panelists by answering them so well that the religious silenced by his astuteness in the answers that he offers to them. And so it is that it's against this backdrop which this particular event that we read about just a moment ago took place concerning teachings about the resurrection. And once again, Jesus finds that the resistance to him goes to a higher level. It might help you to know that the Sadducees were those who in some ways were rivals to the Pharisees. They didn't get along particularly well, but perhaps for the purpose of getting rid of this insurrectionist called Jesus, they might be able to do something that could help them in that regard. And so the Sadducees came to him and gave him this story about the man who died childless and about the brothers who came and who married, pointing to a law that was a part of their accepted scriptures because they only accepted the first five books, the Pentateuch, as being authoritative for their faith. And because Jesus had just recently kind of, well, 
attack the sacrificial practices of the temple. It's easy to understand that the Pharisees and the Sadducees would do what they could to see if they could get rid of him in some way. The law that they referred to was what was known as the Leverite law. It's found in Deuteronomy. The law was intended to ensure the preservation of one's family name, stipulating that if a couple were married and the man died and they were childless, that the brother of that man was supposed to come and to take this woman as his wife and for the purpose of producing offspring to continue the family name. And so they put this question, this hypothetical question to Jesus using the law as the backdrop for it. Jesus, however, was able to avoid the trap. When he say, says that, first of all, they don't understand the resurrection. The resurrection life is contrary to the assumption betrayed by their question is completely different from the life as we know it here and now. There's still a great deal of conversation in the world in which we live about the resurrection and what it's like and what it means and what's going to happen when and where and, and how it's all going to play out. And Jesus points out another thing to them that they had failed to understand the scriptures by him using another passage from the Pentateuch and this was the story of Moses and the burning bush. You might remember that story. We had Moses and the burning bush here on a couple of nights ago at our uh, event for the children here in Trunk or Treat. And you might recall that in that story that Moses asked the question, it says, who am I to say that you are? And the response that he got back was, I am. I am that I am. Present tense. God is. Not God was, but God is. And that's a part of our understanding of the resurrection in these days in which we live. God is, and God has made a promise. We read that passage of scripture yesterday in the service. That, he go, that if Jesus goes and prepares a place for us, he will come again and take us and to receive us in that place. And of course, Thomas didn't quite understand what that was all about. And he says, well, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to get there? To which Jesus replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Well, it wasn't very long after this particular event that the other events took place that they did were able to find a way to, well, bring Jesus to trial to where he was condemned and crucified. Probably not even realizing that this was a part of God's plan for the salvation of the world, even for the likes of them. In about 70 AD or CE, depending on what you look for, the designation these days, the Sadducees just kind of dropped kind of off of the scene with the destruction of the temple. But the evangelists like Luke and Mark continued to proclaim the good news of the power and the presence of the resurrection. 
perhaps there were questions in their respective communities about the resurrection that caused them to include this teaching in their particular version of the gospel. There certainly were other communities that wrestled with this. We see that with Paul later on in Corinthians. And again in Thessalonians, there's questions about the resurrection. And while this passage and what Jesus says that day does not perhaps answer all the questions that we contemplate when we think about the resurrection, it does point to the fact that we're dealing with a God who is and who shall ever be. And so in the context of that kind of a background, we find that the resurrection is something that is promised. It's something that perhaps is a mystery that's beyond our ability to comprehend. Since none of us have fully experienced that particular event. And quite frankly, not many are anxious to do that. At least they're not ready to go in the next few moments. But we don't know whether that will be true or not. But there are a couple of things about the resurrection that we can know. We can know that it's different from what we know to be the time-based existence that we have here. We, we tend to think in the terms of linear time. And I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about eternity or infinity or borderless expanse of things, it's hard for me to comprehend. But there's a sense that no matter whether we're in this life or the life yet to come, we are still in the midst of God's time and God's provision. God's goodness and God's grace. And because we're creatures of time, the ceaselessly aware of the fleeing present bounds of our past and our future, it's hard for us to comprehend anything that is truly timeless. But perhaps we might want to think of the resurrection not so much in chronological terms, but more in distance. How far is the east from the west? Hard to measure that, isn't it? And while even that is limited, it can draw our attention to something that is quantitative or qualitative rather than quantitative. You might say the resurrection that we will live in the near presence of God no matter where that may be in that long continuum, continuum of things that will be brought to that place that Jesus has prepared for us. And even there, we don't fully understand what that may be like. And then there's another aspect of the concept of resurrection that we sometimes struggle with, and that is the, the thought of immortality. And we tie that up with resurrection. Immortality more or less says that there's some part of our spiritual being that will continue on forever. But resurrection says all that we are will continue in the presence of God. It's the whole person is not some wispy part of us that God has promised to redeem and we will, in fact, die barring the return of Christ. And there's no escaping that. But because the one who died on the cross and was raised again, 
we have that hope. We live with that promise that wherever God is, we shall be with him. We cannot die because we are like the angels and the children being children of the resurrection. And again, these are only a couple of ideas and concepts that are a part of the concept of, of resurrection, hopefully from the Christian perspective. And that's why when we come to the place in the Apostles' Creed, we come to a place in there where we talk about that we believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. for whatever that mystery may be. And so on this All Saints Day, we can trust those, entrust those whom we have loved and cared for into the presence of this gracious and merciful God who has done for us that which we could never do for ourselves. Given to us the hope and the promise of our salvation in his holy presence forever and ever. Amen.